Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy that everyone's here and that it's Sabbath and that we have headsets and things such as this in order to make our voices heard better. But whenever you involve any sort of electronics, you also involve the enemy's attacks. So uh, bear with us. First of all, let me just say welcome to the Meridian Adventist Church. We are so uh, thankful that you've decided to join in. And we'd like to encourage you to check out our website. Uh, it's been really uh, newly remodeled, and uh, we're kind of excited about it. You're going to find the pastor's blogs there, and every week one of the three of us will be writing a blog. I believe uh, Karen had one up that posts every Monday morning. It'll be refreshed. So. Uh, you want to look at that? We also have our announcements for anything that may be going on within the church. I know Monday we have a, a special uh, community services outreach with our food pantry again. And then also, if you want to pay your tithe online, it's an opportunity for you to uh, stay curtain with the Lord, and uh, uh, we do appreciate you doing that. And I know God has blessed the Idaho Conference over throughout this entire year. It's pretty much a miracle that we've been able to maintain the level of tithe that has happened. So uh, God is blessing his people, and we thank you for doing that. Before we get started, I'd like to just have a, a word of prayer, and uh, please feel free to send messages before I make the prayer here. If you have a special prayer request that you haven't let uh, Irene or Karen know about, or if you may be joining us from far away and you don't know who I'm talking about, please feel free to send us a message on our website, and we'd be happy to include you in our prayer uh, chain and make sure that uh, you're taken care of. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your blessings, for the fact that you are a uh, God that stays with his people. Uh, you are Emmanuel, God with us. So as we come together today on this beautiful Sabbath morning, and as we are worshiping in strange ways nowadays, we just ask that for your presence in our homes, in uh, our cars, or wherever we may be listening to this right at this time, we just ask that you would be there, and please bless us. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, this week's Sabbath school lesson um, in our quarterly and I hope you all still receive your quarterly. If not, again, let us know. But this whole quarter, October, November, and December, has been about education. And education is very important, as we all know. That's, uh, that's one of the wonderful things about America, is that we've always had free access to education. And um, without that, your people become... Uh, victim to what others might say is truth. So education is important in the sense that um, we get to decide on our own based upon facts and based upon history and things such as that, that we can actually decide for ourselves what we believe. And uh, as you know, there's been a lot of things happening in America with our election and some of the things that have kind of gone on. And I do feel like our world is a little upside down, a little different than what we've been used to over our, my lifetime anyway. And so we need to know where to go to get true education. So I think the quarterly is very timely because we need to know that God is true and his word is true. But there is a lot of, there are a lot of ways to express um, what we see in the world around us, and certainly education in the arts and sciences uh, is uh, one of those areas where people express uh, what they believe and how they have been affected through life and what they are able to project to be true based upon uh, what they have seen in the past. Uh, but I would like to present a thought that the education in arts and sciences for a Christian is a little different than what it might be for someone who is not a Christian. First thing that I would like to look at today is uh, in our, one of our scripture readings, it's taken from Nehemiah 9.6. And if we look at this from the perspective of believers, we say that you alone are the Lord, speaking of God, Yahweh. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. 
The beauty of this world, everything on it, everything in it, everything that is existing today is being preserved by God, the Creator God. Now, it depends on where, what way you look at things. I know uh, there's a saying, one man's junk is another man's treasure. I would say one man's art might be another person's junk. <laughs> it depends on how you look at it, right? I know when my children were young, and we were homeschooling back in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, not because I didn't want them to have a good education, but because I felt like we needed to have a godly education. And in some parts of the world or in America, you, you aren't able to go to a school that necessarily uh, talks about God. So my husband and I were new converts, and we felt that we wanted to uh, give our children the opportunity to learn more about God through school. So at a deficit, <laughs> I became a teacher. And uh, in order to try to make sure I was doing things somewhat right, I would take the kids to the arts and, arts and science museum on occasion. You know, it's interesting. When you see the Lord as the maker and the creator of heavens and earth, and you see the beauty of God, when you go into a place that's really focusing on the arts of the world, sometimes you're just kind of amazed at what people consider as art. And I remember this one time we went, and there was um, a uh, big spread on like half of a wall, and it was called a reclamation art. Well, it looked like to me somebody had just gone along the gutter and picked up styrofoam cups and bags and tin cans and shoes and, and all those things I'm sure that we've, we inadvertently threw out and probably collected somewhere around God's beautiful earth. And they put them all together on a big wall and they made that into an art piece. You know, I'm sure it was art. And I'm sure the person who created it had a, a very big blessing in being creative. And they were definitely making a statement. But I don't think it even begins to compare with what the Creator God has made. And sometimes I know we look at the negative, and I know we, we focus on the bad things of earth sometimes, and we forget to look at the good things. You know, God, God has beauty all around us. Unfortunately, though, what we consider beauty is different in different eyes. The dictionary calls uh, beauty the quality present in a thing or a person that gives intense pleasure or deep satisfaction to the mind. It shows sensory manifestations as shape, color, sound, etc. Or it could be a personality in which high spiritual qualities are manifest. I really liked that last um, interpretation of what beauty was. And I was kind of amazed because it wasn't necessarily a Christian dictionary that I went to. But I think, I think even the common person who may not claim to be a believer can recognize that there are some things that can't be explained. There's some things that take on a level higher than what man can create. Quite often for man, what we do is we worship the creation. We forget that behind that all is actually a creator God. We look at the creation and you know, you, that could be so many different things. I mean, I could give you a, a picture of my grandkids, and, you know, depending on whether I give God the glory or myself or our, my husband and our kids the glory, we're worshiping the creator human rather than the creator God. And I think it's something that we have to constantly be refocusing ourselves in, and I think that's part of the education, part of the process of remembering every day that we're here because of God. We exist and we have our breath because of God. We are his creation, and we are incredibly and wonderfully made, as it's said in Psalm 139. Instead of worshiping what has been created, which is what man does for the things he creates himself, we have to constantly be refocusing our mind on the Creator Himself. You know, I'm a little bit grumpy, and I said this last Sabbath if you were listening, because a lot of the farmland around my house, which was about 20 acres there 
behind and in front of, have been taken out and put into houses. And not that houses are bad and not that people are bad because they want new houses, because they're not. But there's something about taking away the green grass or the growing crops or the cows that are God's. And we start looking at the beautiful homes and the concrete and roads and things such as that. So, you know, I think it's going to be a, something when we talk about these things to our children or to those that don't know God, we have to constantly be refocusing ourselves away from what we see in the world around us and back to what the original creation's intention was. And in order to do that, it's, a, it's going to be requiring effort to take us back. It's a refocusing and truly education. I love any time the Hubble uh, telescope has a picture out there, and uh, there's so many of them of the Milky Way and the different constellations, and uh, every time I see one of these pictures, um, I just, I'm amazed at the grandness and the vastness and the, the precision of God's handiwork. When you focus at those things and you see God in the creation story, it helps us understand that when the earth was made, it wasn't by accident or random, random chemical reactions. When you study it from an educational viewpoint, and I would use the Bible as the cornerstone of that educational tool, you see line upon line and precept upon precept that, that point to the wonder of God's creation. And then when you see science in the world showing pictures like this, it kind of hammers it home, at least in my heart, that there is a creator God and that he has a plan. And he has a plan for our world and he has a plan for you and I. To me, the value of science is, is really in the uncovering of God's plan. And he has provided for his people. He's, he has said that he would never forsake us, or he would never leave us, and that he would give us wisdom. If we look at Proverbs, whoops, if you look at Proverbs number, first chapter of Proverbs, um, Solomon is saying how important it is to look into what um, God is doing. You know, we look at the students of arts and sciences pursue excellence in their studies, and that is true. And Christians do the same thing. I mean, you go to school, you want to get A's if you are pursuing excellence. Uh, you're looking to do your best. But along with that excellence, I believe Christians and people who believe in God have a, an additional level that goes along with their wisdom. And that is knowing the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error. You know, the further people get away from God, the less bound they are to telling truths. The less affected they are by good and evil. Look at movies in the theaters, and maybe I don't really want you to look at them, but if you were to just look at the titles, and if you're just if, on your television, if you, if you happen to get uh, a guide on your television, if you just look down through the guide, how many of what the national networks would say is primetime TV have something extremely evil in them. I remember when a TV program, Lucifer, came out, I thought, really, people are going to watch that? They call that art? They call that something that should be digested and, and believed in? As Christians, we need to keep Jesus in the middle of our our viewpoint, and as these things that represent what the enemy would want us to watch, they're quite different than what God would want us to be watching, that whatever is pure, whatever is of good report, whatever is, gives us joy, not depression, not what some would call art, but yet represents evil. Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, Solomon says, 
to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, in justice, and in equality, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and saying, the words of the wise and the riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, the end of the proverb goes on to describe the curse on those that don't accept God's wisdom and instruction. I don't know about you, but I really believe this year has been totally nuts, and I'm sure you do too. And all through the whole time, you keep thinking, oh my, it's going to get better, it's going to get better, it's going to get better. But it doesn't seem to be getting any better, and it seems to be getting, be getting emotional, just uh, creating more emotional problems. And I'm wondering, is it because we're not pursuing what Solomon is telling us to pursue? Are we pursuing justice and equality? Do we have prudence? Is truth truth and is wrong considered wrong? (laughs) And as more and more people separate themselves from the Word of God, I believe it's getting more and more difficult for that to be known. I believe that we will be fools and we will suffer for that if we don't continue to take ourselves back to the roots. Solomon goes ahead and he says... uh, There's a curse on those that don't accept God's wisdom and instruction. And uh, those that aren't following him will suffer for various reasons. More than anything, they'll suffer emotional trauma, I believe. They says when the end comes, those that don't know God will be crying out for the rocks to fall upon them. I know it sounds dramatic, but, you know, a true education is understanding where we are in history based upon what we have seen in the past in the Word of God. And we can apply that to having faith that what God says in the Word of God will become true later. If our focus is on the truth that is found in the Bible and the history that is found in the Bible and the promises that are found in the Bible, as we move through these times... Those that know these things will have wisdom. But if we look at the entertainment value of what's going on around us right now, I have a feeling that one day down the way, we're going to feel very, very distraught. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, science says that You can study the natural world around us, and you can look at that, and you can you can see answers for all of life's uh, things that are going to happen, or have happened, and will happen in the future. And they apply it, the natural world around them, the carbon thirteen and things such as that, to the application. They apply it to the origin of man. They look at the heat signatures from the novas and the supernovas. They look at the color of lights with the Hubble telescope, and they apply these things that they've been able to track for their lifetime and maybe over the lifetimes since maybe the mid-40s when these things have been tracked. They can, they can tell you based upon that this is what's going to happen. But science can't totally reconcile based upon everything that's in the natural world because we know, according to biblical history, that there were things that were created by a being greater than anything we see in this natural world right now. From the Christian perspective, could there have been a big bang? Well, I suppose it might have banged when God took nothing and made it into a, uh, into a universe and created the earth. But the bottom line is, as a Christian, we also know that the original plan was was tore up, so to speak, by the choice of sin. You see, God is beyond our cognitive abilities. Even the most brilliant of scientists, even people such as Einstein and and, uh, of that genre of people, 
they have had to come back around and, and, and acquiesce to the fact that there is a power that they don't understand. When sin entered the world and people chose to look away from God, all the natural things changed. The things, the original intention of what God had planned changed. And to say that you can predict what man is going to do today based upon uh, the past, I think that would be a hard, hard call because, honestly, nothing is as it was intended to be. And sin causes people to do things that are not predictable. Physics. You know, smart people study physics and things such as that. And to be honest with you, I believe that um, there are really smart people that have figured a few things out. And, and I would accept the fact that because of uh, the advances in health and things such as that we've seen over these years, there are, there are wonderful things that God has led scientists to. And he has done that because he said he would never leave his people. He would prepare a way for us. And uh, I always think of the scripture, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And I believe that applies to scientists. And they may not all be God-fearing scientists. They may be led to God through many of their the discoveries, and they say, how could this have ever happened? But there are some people that have, have banked on the fact that uh, their theory on the Big Bang and evolution and, and, and these things are true. As a matter of fact, some scientists have even come out and said it's a 99.9% .9%, uh, fact that it's true. And I was online this week looking at some of these things, and uh, another very well-accredited physicist took the gentleman who who was saying this 99.9% .9 to task, and he said, how can you even begin to say that? The more we study, the more we don't know. He says, as a matter of fact, you can't even claim a 50% certainty on the origin of man. He said, and he listed all these things, and if you're smart, you might understand what they're talking about, dark matter, dark energy, inflation, the nature of time, the quantum gravity, uh, quantum vacuum. It's way over my head. But I find it interesting. If we accept God's plan in faith, if we accept it as truth, I believe that you can prove that throughout the entire Word of God. It is true. We don't have to worry about where we came from. We don't have to worry that there is a God in heaven that's with us day by day, leading us and guiding us. We don't have to worry about that. You know, God knew that we would have doubts. God knew that there would be smart people taking it to task and attempting to um, lead people away from him. And I believe because of that, he's continually given us proofs in our lives as we believe, as we accept the wisdom that he gives from on high, we can find ourselves in very safe places. You know, science bases their their knowledge on probabilities, and I thought this was rather interesting. It says the odds of you being injured by a lightning strike on any given day are only 1 in 250 million. Probably fairly, very small. But they said that's just in one day in time. But over the average lifetime of any particular human being, it didn't really tell me where and what area of the world you live in. I think uh, just probably some uh, adjustments you could make to that thought, but depending on where you're at. But it says that on average, on an average lifetime of a human being, that the odds are 1 in 9,100 that you could get struck by, by lightning. Does that mean you're not going to go outside? No, it doesn't. It just means that that things happen, and we can't always decide how they're going to happen. But we do know that the God in heaven that promises from the very beginning of time to be with us will continue to be with us clear till the end. And he gives us enough proof in the word that we can rely upon that. If you haven't seen it in your life, I would challenge you to test God and see, because he wants you to know that he's there. You know, there are scientists that have gone through and uh, done probabilities on the on the things that are in the Word, and I think this is interesting. One particular person went through, and he, he looked at all the miracles that Jesus performed on earth. 
And he chose just eight of them. He said, in those eight prophecies, you would have an odds of them being true and happening to any other man. It would only possibly be one in ten to the seventeenth power. That's called one with three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, seventeen zeros after it. And I believe that's a hundred quad, quadrillion is what they call that. It's enough silver dollars, if you laid them on the, on the ground, to cover the entire face of Texas two feet deep. For all the prophecies that are in the Bible about Jesus, about the facts about his life, we have certainty that God sent a man to lead and guide us, to redeem us, to protect us, to provide for us a future and a hope. For me, the most important education is that one which leads to that eternal life. Claiming Christ as my Redeemer, as my Savior, he is, he is yours too. As a matter of fact, he's anybody who wants to be saved. Timothy, who was one of the disciples' protégés, was was, uh, advised by Paul that you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The Bible was written by 40 different men over a period of 1,600 years, and most of these writers were not alive at the same time. So they couldn't work together on any of it. But the Bible has one continuing story flowing through it with absolutely no contradictions. No other book has ever been written that can claim the same thing. To close, I'd like to just say this. There's joy and there's peace that comes through firsthand acquaintance with God through his word. And I pray that as we consider science and as we consider the arts, that if you feel your heart being taken away into dark places, remember that God has a place for you in his word and his, his desires that you would have joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you that in the midst of a crazy world, in the midst of things that it seem dark sometimes and sometimes just not right, that there is a place we can come and we can rest our minds and that we can trust is true and that we can relax and enjoy the beauty of your creation as we look into your word and we see even the remnants in our world around us today. Help us to focus on those things. Help us to give you the glory as the creator God who has a plan and a future for each of us. We thank you, Father, and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.